back guys to our today's session at Daniel Security Academy. As always, have a seat, relax and have your favorite drink filled up before jumping into today's session of Daniel Security Academy. In the last session, we started to dig into the topic of cryptography in general and have also already got some overview of related topics in this area. Today, we will go another flight level deeper into symmetric encryption. We'll have a short recap of the general information slide of symmetric encryption, which also was part in the last session. Then we'll take a closer look into the AES algorithm, how it works, and do a run through of each cycle and operation used. Lastly, we'll summarize what we have learned today and get you started for the next session, which goes another level deeper. Let's recap symmetric systems in general before diving into more detail. As said before, this slide is a repetition of the last session slide. Caesar and Visionaire both are symmetric ciphers and pretty much also the oldest ciphers in place. There is only a single key which is used to both encrypt and decrypt the plain or ciphertext. If you have both the ciphertext and the key, you can easily decrypt the message. Therefore, the key must be protected. This principle is the most important part of symmetric systems and makes them at the same time more difficult. Symmetric encryption methods can be differentiated between block and stream ciphers. The most common block cipher is AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, which we will cover in more detail now. The most known stream cipher is RC4, which is considered to be insecure for years already. To have a secure stream cipher nowadays, we're utilizing also AES, but with a different mode of operation. What this means in detail can be discovered on the next session on this channel. In a symmetric encryption network, you have the following formula to calculate the number of keys in the network itself. It is n times n minus 1 divided by 2, where n is the number of participants. Okay, let's get started with AES. AES offers three different key lengths, 128, 192, and 256 bit, which directly affects how many runs are needed. 10 runs for 128 bit, 12 runs for 192 bit, and 14 runs for 256 bit. The block length of the plain text um, becoming the ciphertext is always fixed to 128 bit, no matter how long the key is. AS has four different kind of operations. First of all, subbytes. Second of them, shift rows. The third one, mixed columns. And finally, add round key. Those are run in a fixed sequence along the different rounds, which can, you can see on the picture on the right hand side. But we'll take a deeper look now into how all those cycles work. Let's start from the plain text, the text which is supposed to get encrypted by the algorithm. This text is sliced down into 128-bit blocks, so if the plain text, for example, is 512-bit long, we'll have four blocks of plain text to be encrypted. In the, let's call it, preparation phase, we will prepare the key for the operation. Depending on the chosen key length, we have either 128, 192 or 256 bits and 10, 12 or 14 rounds of operation. In order to start with round one, we need to do the key expansion of the given key, which is done based on a fixed sequence called AES key schedule. On this way, we derive the round keys from the initial key for each operational round. How these round keys are used will be shown in the next slides. Now let's start into the first round, which is different from the upcoming rounds as it contains only one operation. 
As inputs, we have the plain text block and the first round key. With these inputs, we run the operation add round key. By the name of the operation, you might already imagine that this operation is about adding the round key to the plain text bytes. This is done byte by byte using XOR. So we XOR the first byte of the plain text with the first byte of the key and to receive the first byte of our cipher block. We repeat this for the remaining 15 bytes within the 16 byte block to have the entire first 128 bit cipher block. This will be taken into the second round. The second run, as well as following runs until the final round are the same. The same four operations are run through the, by the same routine round by round. The first operation, which uses the cipher block from the previous round and no round key, is the operation subbytes. Just like in add round key, every byte is running the operation by itself. But this time it runs through a substitution box. This box is pretty much a simple lookup table where you find the new values. Let's take a closer look into the substitution table. This table is fixed no matter when or where you run this algorithm. To find the correct substitute, we split the byte into four bit halves, whereas uh, whereas the first half is determining the row and the other half the column for the lookup. Let's have an example. The input byte is 00111110, representing the number 62 in the decimal writing and 3e in hexadecimal. Now we take the first half, the 3, and choose the correct row, which is pretty much the third row here. Oh, it's actually the fourth row. Um, and afterwards, we take the second half, which is the E, and take the correct column, which is the second last column of the lookup table. By doing this, we have B2 as our substitution value for the input value of 62. Therefore, the original byte is replaced with the value of 1011, 0, 0, 1, 0, representing the decimal number of 178. And you do this for every single byte of the 16 bytes within the block. Once finished, you take the substituted cipher block to the next operation. And the next operation is called shift rows, which also does not use the round specific key, but only the 128 bit cipher block from the previous operation. This operation is a bit easier to understand than subbytes, as we simply shift the bytes within the 4x4 byte matrix. The first row is not shifted. The second one for one position, the third one for two positions, and finally the last row for three positions to the left. Meaning that the second byte in the second row becomes the first byte in the second row after the operation is done. Again. You run this for all the 12 bytes that are being moved and receive the 128-bit cipher block for the next round. We have the mixed columns operation, where we can again only use the cipher block as an input and leave the round key for the next and final operation. Mixed columns is unfortunately not as simple as shift rows, since we not simply just mix bytes inside columns, but well, we are actually having a mathematical equation here. In order to transform a column from the input block to the output block, we need to know that there is a, let's call it, multiplicator table. On the bottom, you see a four by four matrix with different numbers, which represents the multiplicator we are now going to use. In order to receive the B1 uh, byte, B01 byte actually, um, which is the first byte in the second column of the 16 byte block, we have to multiply the first byte of the second column with two. XOR it with the result of the second byte times three. Again, XOR it with the result of the third byte times one. And finally, XOR it with the product of the fourth byte of the column again times one. 
By XORing those four products with each other, we finally have the first byte of the new column created. For the second byte in the second column, we are running pretty much the same operation, but using different multiplicators based on the table below. After you have done this with all four bytes in the column, you move on to the next column until all four columns are replaced with the new values. Okay, let's take a deep breath again after this exhausting practice. The final operation per round is already known to us. It's add route key. Just like in the first round, we simply XOR every byte of the cipher block with the respective byte of the round specific key until all 16 bytes are done. Now we finally have the final cipher block, which will be passed on to the next round of the very same instructions again. For the final round, we have again a different pipeline of instructions. We do start with the subbytes operation again, which is followed by the shift rules operation. So far, so good. However, instead of doing mix columns next, we are skipping this operation and move directly to add round key as the final operation. Once done, we have ultimately gained our first 128-bit block of the ciphertext. This mechanism needs to be repeated as long as we have plain text left that needs to be encrypted. Taking the old Twitter limitation of 140 characters per message as an example, we have approximately 1120 bits of plain text message. Therefore, we would need to run this entire cycle nine times to receive the encrypted version of the 140 character tweet we are just about to post on Twitter. Do you still think 140 characters are short? After understanding how the AES encryption works in detail, we also need to understand that AES is per se a block cipher, but it can be turned into a stream cipher when utilizing the correct mode of operation. Such modes could be GCM, CFB, OFB and CTR. What those abbreviations stand for and how those work will be covered in the upcoming session, which solely takes care of the mode of operations. To understand the situation around AES and why it is being in place for such a long time is that it does not have a lot of competition. The old DES or triple DES algorithm is considered outdated and vulnerable for quite a long time. ID, or IDEA was intended to replace DES instead of AES, but it never reached popularity. Blowfish, on the other hand, is one alternative to AES, but it definitely stands in the shadow of AES spread around the globe. However, it is available and integrated into many different systems. Twofish is the next iteration to Blowfish with some enhancements and might be a good candidate to stand ground against AES and also to possibly gain more popularity. All in all, AES is simply the standard when it comes to encrypting data or messages across the internet via symmetric encryption. That's it for today's session. I hope it helped you guys with learning something new today or simply having a refresh of know-how. I hope to see you in the upcoming videos. Next up is a deeper dive into the different modes of operation for block ciphers. Feel free to leave a comment, questions, and feedback under the video and make sure to subscribe to the channel if you enjoy my content. Have a good one and stay safe.